This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so it's our, unfortunately, our last lecture. Went very quickly this year, I thought. And it's a little sad not to see you. I have four people in the room, though, which is a change. Um, so today, there's one lecture and then uh, the PD, as usual. Um, and then next week, I guess that uh, you don't have anything, so you're supposed to work on your on your uh, revisions. But uh, the, the problem is that we don't know yet exactly the circumstances in which the, the exam will take place. We hope to know that soon. In any case, what I usually do in, the, in this last week is I propose a, a kind of open session. Um, so if you want, I'll send the link. I'll see that with Valentina. I'll send the link and for next Wednesday, uh, nine o'clock, the usual time. And then you can connect and we can chat about anything really. And if you have questions about the lectures or uh, whatever, if it helps you. I mean, there's no obligation, but uh, I usually do that in, in, in real. So we can do that also uh, through GoToMeeting or Zoom or whatever. Okay, so um, last time it was already, already two weeks ago. Sorry for uh, the slight uh, change last week. Sure. Um, so I'm in the last chapter, chapter four, interactions and collective effects. So of course, I had talked about collective effects in the random field Ising model example, but here I want to I wanted to dwell more on, on this. So I told you about choice theory and detailed balance. I'm going to recall a little bit uh, what I said because it's uh, very important for today. Uh, then I told you about the the Ising paradigm, so the fact that uh, um, you can have spontaneous appearance of a collective choice if uh, interaction is strong enough or if uh, uh, temperature or irrationality is low enough. And today I want to generalize the simple choice theory that I gave you last time to the case of multi-agents, um, interacting multi-agents. And this will allow me to speak about uh, a very well-known model in economics or Sociology, I don't know how you want to call it, but anyway, uh, Schelling, Thomas Schelling, who's an overpriced in economics, so I guess uh, must be thought of as economics, pr proposed a model to understand um, segregation effects in cities. And you'll see that this is amenable to a kind of statistical mechanics type of uh, treatment, and it shows a very counterintuitive uh, effect. And then you know, I, of course, this is going to be very quick. Uh, this session is only an hour and a half, a little more. So I won't have time to speak a lot about spin glasses, but I want to tell you uh, very few things about the general phenomenology of what's called in physics spin glasses, but which has many uh, incarnations also in economics and social sciences. And to show you that some of the things that I told you about optimization, I, maybe you remember this idea of fragile optimization. As soon as you change a little bit some of the parameters, you can completely change the solution. That this actually occurs in spin glasses in a very uh, paradigmatic uh, manner. OK, so that's the outline for today. So let me recall what I said last time. I, I was considering a single agent. And this single agent had a certain number of possible choices, alpha, gamma, and so on, to which is associated a certain utility function, u of alpha. And then uh, the rule of uh, the game in decision theory is that agents can revise their decision and change their mind and go from one choice to another. And this is with a certain rate, w alpha to gamma, which is the probability to change your mind from alpha to gamma between t and t plus dt. And this is equal to a certain base rate gamma, uh, capital gamma, divided by 1 plus exponential of beta. And there's also always a sign here to get right, u alpha minus u gamma. 
so beta is positive. It's in physics, it's the inverse temperature. In economics, it's a measure of uh, irrationality, or sometimes it's, it's thought of as a measure of the uncertainty you have on your own utility. You don't exactly know what you want. This is uh, well known in life. And, uh, and the sign, so let's uh, run through it again. So if u gamma is larger than u alpha, so you're more happy with choice uh, gamma, then this is negative. And exponential of beta times a negative number uh, when beta is large is very small. And so you, you actually change uh, nearly deterministically once you've decided to change your mind with, with rate gamma then you do go for the better alternative. So that explains the sign here. Okay. And uh, what we've seen is that this particular choice, which again is a choice that can be justified from first principles in physics, where U is the analog of the energy, um, in social sciences, it's, it's really more uh, a convenient choice. It's something that you know, goes in the right direction. Of course, you make choices that are on average favorable, but the detailed shape of this uh, hopping rate, of the of this rate of change, is very arbitrary and is only motivated by mathematical convenience. So that, that, that's really a problem in a sense, because one doesn't know whether the results that one gets from this particular choice uh, are generic or not, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit uh, more uh, discussion on that later on. But in any case, what makes everything uh, work is that these uh, hopping rates or these transfer rates obey what's called again in physics detail balance, which is that there exists a sudden function h of alpha. such that the ratio of the rate to go from alpha to gamma over the inverse rate is given by uh, such a, a form for any alpha and gamma. And in this particular case, it's very, uh, it's very easy to show that this is the case when U h is, is minus u, but we'll see that this is not necessarily the case and that's going to be one of the main points of today. But then whenever this is true, whenever detail balance falls, then we know what's going to happen uh, at long times. At long times, this, ex this random exploration of choice of the possible choices is going to lead to an invariant probability measure, an invariant distribution, which is that the, the probability to find agent um, in choice alpha, probability to find that an agent has made choice alpha in equilibrium or stationary state is uh, one over some normalization exponential of minus beta h of alpha. Okay, and this is of course the traditional Boltzmann-Gibbs weight in physics. So again, in physics we have a pretty detailed understanding of why detailed balance holds. And of course, detail balance is, uh, is a way to recover uh, the Boltzmann weight. Okay, now I want to put this in a slightly more general context, which is a, a context where there's not only one agent making choices, but many agents making choices, and the utility function of each agent depends on the choice of others, possibly. So. There are many agents, many choices, and um, and they are possibly interacting or not. We'll see. Uh, so I'm going to now right away move my camera. Forget. Okay. Okay, so now I'm uh, considering, as I said, many agents, I equal one 
to n, say, and each of these agents has a certain set of choices. And the configuration of all these people together is described by the set of all the choices they've made. So C, curly C, is going to be a configuration, a configuration of choice. So alpha 1 is the choice made by agent uh, 1 which can be anything in his set of choices or her set of choices. Alpha two, alpha i, alpha n, okay? So it's a pretty big thing. Uh, in the simplest case where, which I talked about last time and also uh, within the random field Ising model, each agent has the binary choice. And, and so this is a space of dimension. I mean, there are two to the n, uh, configuration in that case, but if alpha is something different, and we'll see an example in the shedding model, then the space can be even larger. Alpha can even be continuous variable, uh, whatever. So this is one configuration, and we'll assume that at each time step, uh, one agent changes uh, his or her decision uh, to something else. And this is not this is done one at a time. So uh, in the in the analog of of this rate here, we're only going to consider cases where only one agent changes between t and t plus dt. And so I'm going to call this agent i. And the target configuration is going to be c prime which is the same as C, except that one of the agents has changed to, from alpha to gamma, okay? Of course, this is, again, this is a notation that is not necessarily very explicit. Alpha one doesn't, alpha one, alpha two doesn't mean that all agents take the same decision alpha. Alpha one is the label of the, of the decision made by one, but it's not necessarily the same as the decision made by two. In, in most general, generality, these alphas don't necessarily need to live in the same uh, space anyway. They can describe completely different things. Anyway, so it's a, maybe a slightly confusing notation. So what I'm going to assume is that each agent does it, does this change of uh, decision based on his or her own utility function only. So I'm going to assume that the probability that the system goes from C to C prime is given by something very similar to what I wrote here, which is one plus one over, I mean, gamma, gamma, over one plus exponential beta. And here I'm only taking into account the change of utility of agent I. So UI of, uh, well, uh, so UI of C prime, UI of C, same notation is here, UI of C minus UI of C prime. Okay, so this looks very similar to that, okay? So each agent looks at, at its own or her own, I mean, I don't know what the, to use, his, her, its. Um, so agent I look at its current uh, satisfaction, UI of C, looks at the satisfaction he would have in the next configuration where he changes from alpha to gamma. And then this, depending on this difference, he decides or she decides to do it or not, okay? So now what's maybe uh, unexpected is that I cannot assume right away that these WCs, C to C prime, although they're written exactly the same way as here, I cannot assume right away that detailed balance will hold. It will hold in a trivial manner if the choices, the, the utility functions are independent. That is, if the choice of agent I doesn't affect at all the choice of other agents. But in, in the case where um, agents interact, it's not at all obvious that in general, these, uh, this uh, choice 
uh, allows detailed balance to hold. And I'm going to show this explicitly on, a, on an example. Yes, so there's a question. Yeah, every time you took an agent randomly, but you you just take one at a time. So here it's I, but yeah, I haven't specified it. You right, but it can be any agent can change his mind, of course, or her mind. But at each time step, it's, it's taken randomly, and then you you compute this to know whether you're going to go to the next configuration. Okay, so the question I'm asking now is, can I find a certain function h? now of, of the whole configuration such that the wc to c prime obey detailed balance which is that wc to c prime will follow something analog to this except that instead of having a single choice of a single agent i have here a function of the whole configuration uh, h okay and so what i'm saying is that in some cases so in easy cases, it will be when H of C is simply, so there's a sign difference uh, just to keep the fact that in physics, we're used to Boltzmann Gibbs uh, having an exponential of minus beta H and think of H as an energy, whereas in economics, it's more a utility. So people tend to maximize their utility, whereas physical systems tend to minimize their energy, but that's, uh, that's, that's just a detail. So in the easy case, we would have that H of uh, C is the, the sum over I of UI of, uh, of, of, of alpha I. Okay. So in this case, where the U's only depend on uh, uh, your own choice, then uh, you have this easy rule that uh, detail balance is obeyed just by summing individual utility functions. And then people evolve independently from one another. And so it's not surprising that the whole, system, the whole problem goes back to the uh, uh, single agent uh, case. And you see that if H is the sum of UIs, then the probability, the stationary probability is the product of exponential of UIs. That is, it's the it's product of independent uh, individual probability. So this is. This is the easy case. But let me give you an example which already is not that trivial, which is again uh, the case where there are, there are two possible decisions uh, for each agent. So back to the I think model, back to the binary choice decision, imagine that alpha I is SI equal plus or minus one. And that UI of uh, the whole configuration is H plus HI SI. And here I'm using exactly the same notation as in the random field Ising model, plus uh, some over j different from i, j i j s j times s i. Okay. And so if you want to maximize your uh, utility, then it means that s i, your choice, must be in the direction of the sum of the external field, which we, we call the, the common news, the idiosyncratic field, and the influence of others, okay? So, um, so this is the individual utility function, which we are going to use in this uh, hopping rate, in, in this transfer rate from C to C prime. But what you can show is that, and we'll, we're going to show it, is that H, this function of the configuration that we're looking for, is equal actually to minus sum over i of h plus h i s i. So this first term, which is of course the independent contribution, the, the, what you see independent of what others do, this you just sum over i as, as usual. But 
But then the next term is not the sum over i of this one, it's one half of that. So plus one half of sum over i and j of si j i j s j. Okay? And so in general, this is not equal to minus the sum over i of u i of, of, of s i. There's a one half here. So where does it come from? Well, we just have to uh, check what's going on. Uh, we are going to check that um, h of c prime minus h of c has the correct form in order to ensure that this obeys detail balance. So let me do it uh, quietly. So first of all, let's notice that in this notation here, it means that each jij appears only once. Each ij appears only once. Because, of course, you know, for example, one, say j12, uh, i can be equal to one and j equal to two, but, um, but it can be the other way around. So, there are actually in this sum, there's, uh, there's twice the contribution of jij, but because of the one half here, it's, uh, it, it sh I shouldn't say appear, I should just contribute. Okay. So let me compute H of C prime minus H of C. So H of C prime minus H of C. So what is C prime and what is C? Here, C prime is the same as C, so it's S1, S2, minus SI, SN, okay? So this is what I mean in this general uh, formalism here. When alpha can only take two, two values, then changing your decision is going from SI to minus SI, okay? So you see that in this sum here, the only term that will uh, contribute is, um, okay, so maybe I should change my notation, not to have I's everywhere. I'm, I'm changing the index of the sum to K. And then I'm picking an i here. So among all these k, there's one i that corresponds, there's one k that corresponds to i. And for this one, I need to change s its si into minus si, whereas all the other ones will be the same. So when I take the difference here, all the terms that are not equal to i in this sum don't change and they cancel out. And what I get in the end is twice h plus h i times s i, okay? Twice because I went from s i to minus s i, so the difference is two s i, or minus two s i, but there's a minus sign in front of that. Okay, so the, the, all the signs and the, the, these details, uh, you should you know sit down and think about them, but I hope I haven't made a sign mistake here. And then in this sum here, I should look at all the terms where one SI appears. Okay, so uh, SI, K can be equal to I or J can be equal to, to I. And, but in any case, as I said, each link here appears only once. And so because of that, what you find is that the change of this interaction term, when I change SI into minus SI, is also twice um, the sum over j of kij sj si. Okay, each jij appears once, 
So there's, I mean, again, contributes one, but because I change SI to minus SI, the, contrib the associated contribution changes by a factor two times SI. So that's what we get. And what I'm claiming is that, and this is nearly obvious, that this is also equal to minus ui of c prime minus ui of c. And this is trivial because if you lo just look at, at this term and you change si to minus si, you immediately find, find this, okay? So what I'm saying is that if I choose h to be this function of spins with, again, a factor one half, which is not the sum over i of ui, then I make sure that if I take the ratio, so I make sure because I can identify this uic minus uic prime, that this wc to c prime is also equal to exponential one over one, or gamma, sorry, again, one plus exponential of beta h of c prime minus h of c. Okay. And this is true whatever i I take. So I have a function that is such that I obey global balance at the level of the whole configuration space, the configuration space being uh, the set of all choices. Okay, so this example is very easy in a sense because I can explicitly construct the H of C that uh, makes uh, the choice obey scale balance. But what I insist on is that you see that the interaction term makes the problem non-trivial, makes the, the problem non-additive. And of course, this is expected because we know that in the presence of interaction, the stationary state cannot be uh, a product of individual choices because otherwise it would mean that people are not interacting. So there's an interaction term and this interaction term can completely change uh, the outcome. And that's what I want to show uh, now. So this is, this formalism that I just told you is a way to generalize the random field Ising model uh, to, uh, to non-zero temperature or to uh, non-infinite values of beta, uh, you, we, we know how we would make the whole thing work uh, because of course it's very similar to spins in, in physics. But now I want to change a little bit the framework and tell you about uh, the shedding model and treat the shedding model within this general formalism. And so the, the aim will be first to define the model, and second will be to find this famous function h of c that allows the tools of statistical mechanics to describe the equilibrium state of the system. Okay, so as I said, the Schelling model was invented uh, by Thomas Schelling in the 70s. And if you want to read more, there's a literature that has developed in the physics uh, community recently, but the Thomas Schelling himself has a very nice book called uh, From Micromotives to uh, Macro Behavior, where he's interested exactly in this you know, transition from single agents to uh, collective effects. And so what he, what he was trying to understand was um, the fact that uh, in US cities in particular, there's a very strong racial segregation. Uh, and, and what he was puzzled by is that if you make surveys at the level of individual people, um, you know, of course, you know, not all states are equivalent, but in many states where there's a strong segregation, people individually don't feel intolerant. 
they don't feel that they want to live in their own community, uh, their own uh, in a community made by the same uh, race. So there's a kind of contradiction between individual preferences where people are not necessarily opposed to living in a mixed neighborhood and the actual observation that uh, cities tend to be extremely segregated. And so he came up with a, a very simple model. And what I'm going to tell you about is a model that's inspired by the initial model. And it's not exactly the same, but it has the same uh, flavor. So what I'm going to imagine is a city made of uh, neighborhoods. So each square here is going to be a neighborhood, and the neighborhood is going to be labeled by the position of the center of the neighborhood, for example. And each neighborhood is going to be occupied by a certain number of people, uh, and there will be a, a number of, of vacancies or uh, empty spaces or unconstructed sites, the way you want to, to think of it. And so I'm going to describe each neighborhood by the density of people in that neighborhood. So rho of R is equal to, so if I, if I want to be really physical, each neighborhood is going to be to assume, to, be assumed to have a, a square shape with a linear size L. And so rho of R is the number of people living in neighborhood R divided by L squared. Okay. And what I'm saying is that uh, here there's no question of race, there's just a question of occupancy, of density of population. And what I'm going to assume is that uh, people don't like to live in crowded neighborhoods because everything, I mean, you know, I can tell you the story, but you can imagine that if you live in an overcrowded neighborhood, Everything is difficult, parking your car, noise, blah, blah. But people don't want to live either in uh, deserted neighborhoods. Uh, if you live in a neighborhood where there's no, nobody, and then there's no coffee houses, there's no cinemas, blah, blah. So you don't want that either. So we're going to assume that people have a preference for living in a kind of half-filled the happy middle of half filled neighborhoods. So I'm going to assume that rho of R, that you know, this is normalized in such a way that this is something that belongs to zero one. Zero means there's nobody, of course, and one means that it's fully occupied. So um, what is the utility of agent I living in neighborhood R? So here you see the choice of agents will be the neighborhood. So it's not a binary choice. It's a, it's a choice that you know, can have uh, infinite values if the city expands forever, uh, but it's a, it's a location here. So this is the equivalent of the choices that I talked about before. Uh, U of R is going to be equal to uh, Two u star times rho of r if rho is less or equal to a half, and uh, two u star one minus rho of r if uh, rho is greater or equal to a half. So what what does it mean? It means that if I plot u as a function of rho, I have a tent shape function that peaks around one half, at one half, and its maximum is u star. Okay, so that's, that's what this function encodes. And the choice here of a tent shape is just to make the calculations uh, easier. But what I'm going to tell you about does not depend on this particular choice. I mean, you can choose other functions. So for example, you might not like this, uh, this cusp at one half. So I could have chosen a function that does like this. 
it doesn't really matter. I mean, the, this function, tent shape function, is just there to illustrate the point. It's not a, a major uh, aspect of the modeling uh, choice, modeling procedure. But so what I'm heading at here is that people in shedding the uh, analog are, you know, they, they don't want to live in, other, in either extreme. So it's like in the racial problem of shedding, people don't want, actually people are tolerant. They, 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 they actually prefer living in half-filled uh, neighborhoods. So they're, they're happy to be uh, in, in a mixed neighborhood in that sense. So that's the setup of the model. And what I'm going to look at is a, a case where the average density, which I'm going to call rho bar, which is the total number of people divided by the total area of the city, if you want, the average density is exactly equal to one half. So that's the choice that I'm going to make in order to amplify uh, the point that's going to get out of the calculation is that on average, there's enough people and enough spaces such that all neighbors, all neighborhoods could be filled at exactly one half. Okay? So in, in, in principle, everything, everybody can be happy in this model because there's exactly the right size of the city if you want to ac accommodate everybody in half space, a half filled neighborhood. And in principle, because everybody wants that, this naturally should be what you find, right? So let's see what happens in the model. And in order to understand what happens, I need to give a rule for uh, what people do. And so I'm going to choose the choice theory that I've uh, exposed earlier. So what I'm going to assume is that the probability for an agent to go from R to R prime, okay, is uh, gamma divided one by one plus exponential of beta u i of uh, rho of R minus u i of rho of uh, R prime. So if you want, this is the index i means that it's agent i who is moving. He's moving from r to r prime. And what he wants to see is whether the neighborhood at which he decides, I mean, that he you know, visits to know whether he's going to uh, move is uh, better suited than the current neighborhood. So he looks at this function here. And if he, if he sees a neighborhood where U is uh, higher, he goes there with higher probability. If, if not, he still may go there, but with lower probability. So if beta goes to infinity, he really systematically goes to neighborhoods that are better from his point of view. But you see that, again, his decision or her decision is made based on only what happens to uh, his or her utility function. The choice doesn't take into account the fact that when you leave a neighborhood, you're going to lower the, the, the density, obviously, and therefore you're going to change the utility function of others because suddenly people will find themselves in a less populated environment. But that you don't care. You do it whatever. And so people here, uh, you know, take selfish decisions in that sense is that they only care about their own utility, but they don't care about what they leave behind. And we'll see how we could take that into account to uh, obtain a better social outcome. So clearly, you know, what I'm going to show you, you, you guess because this is the whole uh, knack of the shedding model, is the fact that although we've put everything in the model apparently to get the right social outcome, so the right social outcome would be that everybody lives in half space neighborhood, then the dynamics, the stochastic dynamics here, is going to lead to a completely different outcome. 
and it's going to lead to neighborhoods that are completely empty and neighborhoods that are more crowded than one half, which is very surprising. But in order to show this, we have now the tools that we need, which is quite remarkable because we're going to be able to map the problem in a sense to a problem of the liquid gas uh, transition. Okay. So now let's look at how the general framework that I've tried to tell you about, the construction of the H function, how does this work in the in the current situation? I think that one microphone is on. I think yes. Thank you. Okay, so let me again try to understand what's going on. So if I have one agent moving from R to R prime, how does it change the densities? Well, clearly C prime, C is 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 the set of all the row of uh, Okay, this is the, what uh, describes a configuration. It's the, it's the, that's what I'm going to choose to describe a configuration. I'm not, I could choose to describe the configuration by the position of all the agents, but actually the only thing that is going to matter is the density. Okay, so if one agent goes from R to R prime, then uh, C prime will be the same density rho of X when X is different from R and R prime. Okay. And then rho of R will have decreased a little bit by uh, one unit, so by one over L squared. And R prime, on the contrary, will have increased by a little bit, which is one over L squared. Okay. So that's my new configuration. And what I want, what I need to construct is, what is the, what is it that I want? Exactly as in the Ising case, I want to construct H of C such that, H of C prime minus H of C is equal to minus UI of uh, R minus UI of R prime, of rho of R minus UI of rho of R prime. Okay? If I manage to construct such a function, uh, which in a sense now is going to be a kind of functional of all these densities, then as I've shown in the Ising case, I ensure that the choice at the individual level corresponds to detailed balance at the global level, okay? So I'm going to assume that there exists such a function. So I'm going to assume that H of C is a sudden function of all the rows. And I need to understand how does this function evolve when I go from C to C prime. So if I assume that L is sufficiently large so that one over L squared is very small compared to one, I can make a kind of Taylor expansion, if you want, of how the change of density on R and on R prime is going to change the function H that depends on all the density. And so what you find is that 
h of c prime minus h of c, then all the, the rows that have not changed don't contribute at all. And only the change that I've uh, uh, imposed to the, the density at r and at r prime will contribute to this change. So what I get is uh, derivative of h with respect to rho of r times uh, minus one. Well, let's say it that way. dh e rho prime times one over l squared minus dh e rho of r times one over l squared. I'm assuming that h is a function of all the densities. If the density is changed by a little bit, then I can tailor expand the variation. So I have the derivative of h with respect to rho of r prime times the change one of r squared, plus the derivative of dh with respect to rho times the change minus one of r squared. Okay. And as I said, this must be equal to what? It must be equal to uh, minus u of rho of r prime minus u of rho of r. OK. So the, thanks to this equation here, I can, you know, uh, guess what h should be. If I take h to be uh, the antiderivative of u with respect to rho, it's going to work. So let's, let me write it down and then we'll check. So this is the function, this is the equation which must be true for all rho of r, rho of r prime, that ensures that if I can find a function h that obeys this equation, this differential equation in rho, if you want, uh, then I'm sure that I will have detailed balance. Okay? I will have detailed balance, although people act individually and only follow their use, uh, the function h will ensure that globally the system obeys detailed balance, even taking into account the interaction. This is exactly the same story as for the Ising model where you can find an h, which is not the sum of the u, but which uh, ensures that a scale balance is obeyed. OK, so let me give you the solution, and then we'll see by eye that it works. So what I'm claiming is that if I choose h of all the rows of x, equal um, L squared sum over all r's, all x's, of the integral from 0 to rho of x, There's a minus sign that I shouldn't forget. Uh, u of um, rho prime, e rho prime, and then plus an arbitrary constant a times rho. So this is a general solution of the detail balance uh, criterion, because you see that if I take the derivative of this function of all rows with respect to a certain row of r, I'm going to pick in this sum r equal to x, and I will take the derivative with respect to rho, which is easy because it's the 
is an uh, antiderivative. So the derivative with respect to rho of r will give me u of uh, rho of, of r, which is exactly what I need. Okay, and this will give a constant, and the constant will disappear because if I'm subtracting uh, the two derivatives computed at different points, a just cancels out. Okay. So this is the solution I'm looking for. And you see right away that what is interesting is that this is not equal to uh, integral sum over x of uh, rho of x u of, of rho of x. There should be maybe a, an L square normalizing, but anyway, it's it's, it's a different uh, functional of rho. This would be the naive thing, you know. If each agent has a utility u of rho, then the number of agents having that utility is the number of people in neighborhood x rho of x times u. So this is the this would be the independent assumption. But you see clearly that what I have here is not rho u of rho, is the, the, the antiderivative of u. Okay. Great. So that's the solution I was looking for. And now, what can I say about the long time evolution of the system? So let me recall what uh, we know. We know that if, recall, if w c to c prime over w c prime to c obey detail balance, then at long time, I know that the equilibrium distribution, the probability to find a sudden configuration is one over z exponential of minus beta h of c. So now I'm going to use this result to try to understand what this result tells me in terms of the densities. I'm going to try to interpret what it means, but uh, that's the whole power of having a, a model that obeys detail balance is the fact that you know right away what the stationary state is going to be. But at this stage, I should uh, put a big warning sign which is the possibility of slow dynamics. Okay? So it's always the case that, you know, when you read papers on uh, Monte Carlo dynamics or master equations or Markov chain evolutions, then it's great because you can get a stationary state that's explicit, which would not be the case for arbitrary choices of the Ws. But on the other hand, you know, you don't know at all if you're going to reach the stationary state quickly or slowly. And this is a, a problem that sometimes is, is not present, that is on reasonable time scales, you reach the equilibrium. But in some cases, uh, and in particular in this model, when you try to make a numerical simulation, you realize that although the stationary state is uh, that one, then you can have a very slow dynamic setting in. And, uh, and so, you know, there's a whole discussion that should be made and it's often uh, eluded in, uh, uh, in, in the literature, in, in, in particular in economics literature, is how fast do you reach equilibrium? And, and this question of uh, the speed at which you reach equilibrium is of course absolutely uh, crucial to know whether what you're talking about is meaningful or meaningless. And there's a lot of, uh, uh, models in economics where people assume equilibrium without really trying to answer the question of is it reasonable to think that the dynamics is going to lead me to equilibrium quickly or slowly. And in particular, well, in, in the physics problem, there's a lot of examples where uh, the system has a Boltzmann distribution in equilibrium, but never reaches it, like glasses, glassy systems or the spin glasses that I'm going to talk about, 
they are special systems in the sense that although you know their equilibrium state, in reality, if you observe the systems even over you know, uh, uh, astronomical time or geological time, they are actually out of equilibrium. So you know, beware of these general statements that look great, but actually sweep a lot of uh, issues under the rug. Okay, so having said that, let me apply this general result to the problem at hand. So I, what I want to know is what is the stationary distribution or the equilibrium distribution of a sun set of rho of x. Okay. So again, a configuration is described by a set of densities. You should know all the densities in all the neighborhoods, rho of rho one, rho two row three and so on. And this gives me uh, a description of the uh, a coarse grain description of the equilibrium because at this stage I've lost the information of who lives who. I just have a, an, a, an information about the densities in each neighborhood. And the probability to observe a certain configuration, row one, row two, row three, well, I know it is going to be given by the Boltzmann weight. So there's a, a normalization. There's a Boltzmann weight that I've uh, written here. So it's going to be given by uh, exponential of minus beta uh, L squared sum over X of V of rho of X. where I've introduced the notation here, I'm going to call the antiderivative of u v. So, well, <coughs> just write it here. So v is such that v prime of rho is equal to u. And Importantly, because there's a minus sign in H uh, and a minus in front of the of the H in the Boltzmann way, there's a plus in the end that comes here. Um, the sum of rex of rho of x, this is the, the total number of people in the city, so this doesn't change. So A is, uh, is arbitrary constant and it's actually you can reabsorb it in the normalization. It doesn't play any role. I'm dropping it. But there's something that you should uh, uh, be familiar with, which is the fact that this is the weight that comes from uh, the people, the choice of the people. But there's on top of that, in the probability distribution of all the rho of x, an entropy term, which comes from the fact that as I've said, I'm describing the configuration in terms of densities and not in terms of who lives where. And therefore, for a given choice of rho, uh, there's a, there's a, a combinato combinatorial problem, which, is, which leads to an entropy term on top of that, which is given by, I'm going to write it, exponential of S of rho, which is the number of uh, possible choices to put my, all my individual in the city with the correct uh, choice of densities. And S of rho is given by the familiar entropy term, which is the, the ideal gas entropy, if you want. So it's sum of rex of uh, rho of x uh, log 
of rho of x plus 1 minus rho of x log of 1 minus rho of x. And there's an overall minus sign. So if you want to be you know, very precise about going from individuals to densities, you should take into account this entropy, which you can see is, is a kind of Jacobian in the transformation from people's uh, position to uh, the density field. But the, the entropy is going to actually, as usual, at low temperature, the entropy is not going to matter. So I'm going to focus on beta large, such that S is negligible. One can actually do the theory completely also with uh, en the entropy term, and I'll give you the results at the end, but what I'm going to focus on is just this term here, uh, and I'm going to disregard the entropy contribution. So, okay, so now I have my, the probability of a given set of densities, which is given by the exponential of beta, the sum over x of some function v of the density. Right, okay. So what, what should I do? I mean, this is, uh, this is what the probability of observing a certain set of density uh, is. But if I want to make this more concrete, more visible, I should you know, try to speak about the most probable uh, configuration. And in particular, when beta goes to infinity, this is uh, everything that's going to matter is what are the most probable the most probable configuration configuration Okay, well, so I need uh, to look at the sum of rho x of v of rho of x and try to find the configuration of rho that maximize such an object with the definition that v prime is equal to u. And so if I want to give you the explicit function, v of rho is equal to u star rho squared, when rho is less than one half, and u star two rho minus rho squared minus one half, when rho is greater or equal to a half. And what I need to do is um, to try to find the configurations of the rows that maximize this v of rho with the constraint that the average value of rho is equal to one half. Okay, this is the case that I've chosen because it's the most uh, uh, spectacular case, if you want. So V of rho is a certain shape here that I could draw, but it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, this is the explicit form. And here I'm left with a, a problem that uh, we're used to in uh, statistical mechanics, which is, you know, in a sense, the, the problem of a liquid gas transition, where the, there's an entropy contribution that I'm discarding anyway, and then there's an energy contribution telling you, uh, you know, what is the typical energy of a, a gas with, with a sudden density. And so by analogy, And one can show that it's indeed the case, but by analogy, one can look for a solution where rho takes two values. So look for a solution such that rho is equal to rho plus 
greater than one half with probability p and rho minus less than one half with probability one minus p. Okay. So if I do this, I see that the sum over x of v of rho of x is equal to the number of neighborhoods times p v of rho plus plus 1 minus p v of rho minus. And I should optimize over p rho plus and rho minus with uh, the constraint, so I'm looking for the maximum of this, with a constraint that p rho plus plus one, mi one minus p rho minus must be equal to one half, or more generally to rho bar. Okay, so you know, if I do this, well, maybe I, I will find that in the end, rho plus is equal to rho minus, or that p is equal to one. So that would be a, a uniform solution. But I can also find solution where rho plus and rho minus are different, and p is neither equal to uh, zero nor to a half. And again, in the limit where beta goes to infinity, in the low temperature limit, and for this particular choice of uh, V of rho, I'm, I'm not going to you know, give you the calculation, which is not very difficult, but a little heavy. Um, one has to you know, distinguish different cases. But in the end, what one finds is that the configuration that maximizes, so the optimal configuration, or the most probable configuration, because you see that if I maximize this object, Again, I'm insisting on the fact that most probable configurations is, amount to maximizing this object. So if I maximize this object, if I'm optimizing this object, I'm also maximizing the probability of, of observing such a configuration. And the optimal choice, the optimal uh, uh, con configuration are such that rho minus equals zero, rho plus equals uh, square root of two over two. And this is also equal to P. It turns out that, you know, don't give too much meaning to this, but it turns out that rho plus is square root of two over two, which is 0.7 and uh, rho minus is zero. So you see by, you know, inspection that P times rho plus is one half and because rho minus is zero, this doesn't contribute. So I'm satisfying the constraint. But you also see that the optimal configurations, the configurations that you'll see most often are such are the following. So if I draw my little city again with neighborhoods, I will have with probability 0.3 completely empty spaces and with probability 0.7 neighborhoods that are overcrowded with a density rho plus, which is uh, square root of two over two. And this is the most likely configuration. And so this is the you know, very surprising result that um, uh, Schelling was able to show experimentally. I mean, it's quite remarkable the way Schelling did. Schelling simulated uh, this, his model with coins, and he was making you know the, the the changes without any computer at the time. He was making these changes by hand, and he was seeing that systematically by following rules similar to this, he was you know uh, led to uh, segregation of these coins, coins of different colors, and so it was a very also visual uh, way to to see it. But in any case, uh, the the transposition of the shedding model to the physics language 
is due to uh, a paper by Grovin, Bertin et al. Uh, that you can find easily on, on the net that I can also give you, I can give you the reference, but it's in, it's in TNAS, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And, uh, and so they, they essentially do what I've uh, told you today. So what is nice is that we have this completely paradoxical result. If you want, you know, the story of uh, Adam Smith, Adam Smith thinks that if people act, act selfishly uh, and optimize their own welfare, then the society as a whole is going to benefit. And here in this case, you see an example of the exact opposite, that people follow what they want to do and everybody you know, is doing something that he or she feels is good for him or her. But in the end, collectively, it's a disaster. And it's a disaster because there's this, uh, this the, the, the fact that the rule of the game doesn't take into account uh, the pain you leave behind. And the fact that when you ch change uh, your, your position, the people living in your ex neighborhood are uh, worse off. And so they, want, they will try to leave too, and so on. And this is the mechanism by which uh, the configuration where everybody lives in the same neighborhood is actually unstable dynamics. If you start by a configuration where all the neighborhoods are filled with uh, density one half, you can show that you know, accidentally someone is going to leave and then the whole situation will evolve how uh, this situation, although maybe on long time scale. So it's a very beautiful model, I think, in that sense. And uh, let me give you a few more uh, information about the model. Uh, one is what happens if beta is non-infinite, if beta is, uh, is if we're not in the low temperature limit, well, in the low, if you um, increase temperature, you decrease beta, and you see that in the limit where beta goes to zero, but a very high temperature, only the entropy matters. And clearly, as you all know, the, the entropy is maximized for rho equal one half. <laughs> and so obviously, if people take choices completely at random, then the density is going to be uniform, right? Because if you completely choose randomly, then all neighborhoods are completely equivalent. And in the end, you'll end up with a uniform distribution. And this is driven by entropy, exactly as in the liquid gas transition. As you increase temperature, at one point, energy won't matter anymore, and you'll recover uh, a gas phase which is uh, uniform in space. But if you lower temperature, you know that in the liquid gas transition, there's a phase stretch separation. The liquid goes on one side and leaves the void behind. And so, in a sense, it's the same thing that we see here. Um, and so you can show that in this model that there, there exists a critical temperature beta C such that uh, at higher temperature, so for beta greater than beta C, there's segregation. And for beta less than beta C, there's uh, the, the solution is uniform. So that's an insight that we know very well from physics, but uh, which is maybe more surprising if you don't know the phenomenology of phase transition and so on. So we're in, in known territories here. We know that uh, collective effects can completely change what, you, uh, would in, uh, what your intuition would tell you from microscopic elements. Here we see that Microscopically, people want to live in half neighborhood, half filled neighborhood, but collectively, because of this systematic application, systematic iteration of the dynamical rule, that is the one that I've given you, you end up in uh, in dire straits. Okay, so is there a way to improve?
the situation. So there's a question also that is uh, addressed in the paper that I've uh, that I've referred to. Is there a solution to this conundrum? So is there a way that maybe the state or maybe uh, social uh, solution can help the system coordinate and find uh, a more acceptable uh, maximum con uh, configuration, optimal configuration? So the idea that um, they propose in the paper that the authors that I've uh, mentioned proposing the paper is to say well let's help people in doing the right thing by imposing a kind of tax which is that um as i've, I've shown you there's h but there's also the total u which is uh the sum over x of rho of x, u of rho of x. So this is something that people don't really know about individually, the total uh, satisfaction of people. But a, a superstructure like the state could measure this uh, global utility. And as people make their choice, they should be aware of the change in total utility that they their choice uh, um, uh, induces. So instead of only looking at the change of individual utility, you can think that maybe if I in the in the decision rule, if I change delta u u of rho of r minus u of rho of r prime into delta u plus zeta times delta capital U minus delta U. So sorry, maybe my capital U is not different enough from small u. So what I'm saying here is that there's a parameter zeta, which on top of the change of your own utility, adds some contributions from the change of the global utility that your move uh, provokes. Okay, so if zeta is equal to zero, you recover the previous model. If zeta is equal to one, you don't take into account your own utility, you only take into account the global utility. So you can think of that as, as a kind of tax, right? If you change the utility of others, you must pay something and therefore it's going to reduce the probability of making your, your move. The zeta here is a parameter that you can interpret as a tax. And you can redo the whole calculation that I've done. Uh, it's actually quite easy because in the end, what you find if you redo uh, the whole step is you find that V of rho, the antiderivative of U that I uh, found before, this one, is just transformed into one minus zeta V of rho plus zeta rho u of rho. And this is not surprising. It's just uh, you know looking at what I've uh, defined here, I see that there's the part that comes from the v of rho that I had before, but a, a part that also comes from the total utility rho u of rho. So you turn the crank, you do the same calculation as the one I've uh, Sketch for you. You you look for the maximum uh, probability, the, the configuration with maximum probability, and what you find is that as a function of uh, zeta, the total utility per agent u divided by n is going to have the, the following shape. So this is one here. Red you don't like, 
So let me choose blue, for example. So what happens is that for data equals zero, um, with the values of rho plus equals square root of two over two that I've given you, you can compute um, the maximum the, the, the utility per, per agent is given by, I don't know, blue you shouldn't see either, maybe yellow or green. So you start from a, a value that's around 0.3 U star. By the way, the, the completely uniform um, solution you can also compute its uh, utility its its u star over four so point twenty five u star if you if you're all mixed, but the segregated solution has a better U star per person, which is 0.3 instead of 0.25. It's just re-saying what I was saying that the system will segregate. But what's really interesting is that as you increase data, there's a value of data which is one third, where you reach uh, U star over two. Sorry, you stop. So um, what you see is that by introducing this extra tax, at first you improve the situation, but it still remains suboptimal. And then at one point you reach um, uh, you reach the optimal uh, state uh, of everybody segregates, everybody uh, living in. In the same neighborhood. So that's an example where the, the um, Adam Gibbs, Adam Smith uh, invisible hand fails, but you can help it by having um, these taxes that uh, I talked about. Okay. So that was the, the, the main message. What I want to finally end on this uh, problem is that I've assumed uh, in the choice theory, I've assumed a very particular shape of uh, hopping rate. You remember that I've uh, insisted on that from the beginning. Um, I've assumed that the Ws are given by this uh, so-called logistic rule. W C to C prime is given by gamma over one plus exponential beta delta U. So this has allowed me to find an H function that is such that the whole system obeys detail balance. And thanks to detail balance, I can find the stationary distribution and show that the system is going to segregate. But what happens if I take different choices for this uh, transition rate. Uh, as I've said, in physics, it's something that is justified from first principles. But in social sciences, you know, why on earth would people follow exactly that rule? Uh, and here it's, it's a little bit of an open question is whether the results that I've shown you today are uh, robust against different choices of this individual uh, hopping rate, or if uh, this whole phenomenology is going to completely disappear if I change uh, sufficiently this rule. So for example, I could choose, I don't know, if I, if I go from this particular shape to a, a certain function of delta u, which is general, will this change completely the the, the final results, or will the final results be, you know, qualitatively similar? 
all the results. Robust. And in a sense, this is a very general question because uh, if you lose detail balance, then we're in the realm of uh, non-equilibrium statistical physics in a sense where many dynamical systems don't obey detail balance. And there's no general theory for that. So uh, phase transitions, in some, case, in some cases, they resist the existence of, uh, of non-detail balance effects. In other cases, the, the, the phenomenology is completely different as soon as you introduce uh, a little bit of uh, a violation of detail balance. So because of that intuition, it, I, I draw your attention to the fact that in social sciences, there's, a, you know, there's a, this question of knowing how robust are the results is very uh, uh, rarely posed because it's difficult, of course, because we lack tools. And I think it's a, it's a very interesting question in general to know whether these uh, segregation effects, for example, or these phase transitions, they exist beyond the realm of detailed balance and Boltzmann Gibbs, or if they're uh, very fragile to any change of the detailed balance condition. Okay, so that's. Uh, what I wanted to say on the shedding model. And what I'd like to finish on is uh, so my, you don't see any more the outline of the lecture, but it doesn't matter. So I want to finish on a few words on spin glasses. So the spin glass problem is uh, is the problem of spin, which is given by an energy, which I call H, of the configurations, Si, which is simply the term of interaction between spins. And for, the, for now, I'm completely neglecting all the uh, individual terms, so I'm putting to zero H I and capital H. So there's only interaction and the JIJs are random, for example, Gaussian variables of zero mean. So what does it mean to have JIJs random of zero mean? It means that for some pairs of spins, the J is positive and therefore spins want to be aligned, either up or, or down. But if JIJ is negative, then spins want to be anti-aligned. And so there's a mixture of that. Some spins want to be aligned with one another. Some spins want to be anti-aligned to one another. And this uh, causes a headache in a sense. So it's called frustration. And so the, the typical little graph that you can draw is a triangle where you have, for example, J negative here, J negative here, uh, and J positive here and J positive here. So if this spin is up, uh, this spin wants to be up, but this one doesn't know what to do, okay? So you have a problem with many constraints, and these constraints are uh, contradictory to one another. So this is the archetype example of an optimization problem with uh, constraints that are not compatible with one another, okay? And it leads to a very, very interesting set of, uh, of phenomenon that I'm going to summarize in a few moments, but uh, you know you, you you can think of this problem in a in a social context in the following way. I mean, it's of course a, a toy example, but I think it's a very visual one. So imagine that you have a 
a class of uh, 50 students and you want to organize a boat trip, but you have only boats with uh, 25 capacity. So you, you want to split your, your, your class in two groups. So groups that are going to, a group that is going to go to boat A and a group that's going to go to boat B. And you make a little survey beforehand and you try to know who likes whom in your class. Okay, and so you have 50 individuals and you're going to map out all the 50 times 49 uh, divided by two if you assume that liking in, is a symmetric uh, uh, condition, which is unfortunately not always the case, but anyway. So if, uh, if JIJs are symmetric, then um, you're looking for 50 times 49 over two uh, information about uh, your class, pieces of information. And if JIJ is positive, it means that uh, the two people in, in question like each other and would prefer being on the same boat. And if JIJ is negative, then they would like to be on separate boats. Okay. Uh, well, the question of optimizing this uh, function over the SI, so you, you need to find which SIs are plus and which SIs are minus, which will correspond to which people you put on the A boat and which people you put on the B boat in such a way that uh, the global satisfaction is maximized. So that's what it would correspond in terms of, uh, of this uh, city example. And the problem is that Although the, the, the problem, uh, although the, the equation seems uh, incredibly simple, finding the ground state, finding the optimal configuration for a given choice of JIJ is extremely difficult algorithmically. Uh, it, the, the algorithms uh, allowing you to find the, the true ground state, the true optimal configuration, uh, are exponentially long in n. So as you grow the system size. Uh, the time you need to spend to find the, the real ground state is going to grow exponentially with the size of the system. We don't know yet. Maybe one day we will show, but there's very little hope of that, that this problem is uh, polynomial in the number of spins, but uh, everybody believes that it's actually not and that even the best algorithms won't be able to find the solution uh, in a time that polynomial in the in the system side. So it's an incredibly complicated problem to solve. But at the same time, there are many configurations that are quasi-optimal. So if you're really insisting on finding the optimal configuration, it's very difficult. But on the other hand, there's a lot of configurations that are locally optimal. So what does it mean that it's locally optimal? It means that locally optimal configuration or one spin flip stable, it means that each spin SI is in the direction of the local field. So you remember the random field Ising model where there was on top of that an idiosyncratic field and ex external field. But here I'm, I'm having a simplified view on that where there's only the interaction term. And if everybody, every spin is, is in such uh, configuration, it means that you know, I cannot improve that if I flip SI, it's going to be worse. So nobody wants to change individually. Of course, there might be the collective move improving uh, uh, the, the energy or improving the utility of everybody, but individually, people cannot do that. People are locally happy if you want. So you can look at the number of solutions of this problem. And what you find is that the number of solutions, the number of configurations such that this is true, is, is exponentially large in N. So the number of configurations in a spin problem is of course two to the N, okay? And the number of configurations that satisfy such a constraint when Js are random Gaussian variables of zero mean, is exponential of 
0.2 times n. So of course, 2 to the n is much greater than exponential of 0.2 times n, because log 2 is 0.7 and not uh, 0.2. But, um, but you see that you still have an enormous amount of possible choices such that this is uh, satisfied. So there's a lot of metastable states in the system, a lot of configurations that are locally stable, and a lot means really a lot because you have a, a combinatorial type of uh, explosion of the number of solutions. So it's, a, it's an interesting problem where, although the, the true solution is, is hard to find, there's a lot of secondary minima, if you want, or secondary maxima, if you want to think of it in terms of utility, secondary minima in terms of energy, secondary maxima in terms of utility. And so let's look a little bit at graphically at what happens. So it's traditional to draw the graph that I'm going to draw, although it doesn't make sense really because uh, the configuration sp space of spins is, uh, is not a one-dimensional space at all. You see that, you know, for example, if I want to look at the configuration of uh, n equal two spins, it's a, it's a square up, 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 down, 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 up. So this is the configuration space for n equal two. And for n equal three, it's a, it's a cube. And if you go to higher dimension, it's a hypercube of dimension n. Uh, so I'm going to you know, plot this space, which is you know, topologically completely different from a, a line. I'm still going to draw it as a line because we can't do anything else on the board. But you know, be careful that this is very misleading by many accounts. Anyway, it's, tra it's a traditional way to make the point. So if I plot H as a function of configuration, what you find for the spin glass problem is an extremely rough and complex landscape. Let me try to do it right. So there's a lot of, it's very rough. So as soon as you change the configuration a little bit, you change uh, the energy uh, in a kind of random way. But also if you look at, so here I'm speaking in terms of physics, where I'm looking at the low energy state, and you should flip this uh, up down if you want to think of it in terms of utility, but you see that on my graph, I guess that this is the absolute minimum, okay? So this is the ground state I should choose if I'm a rational person, but, or if you want at zero temperature, this is where the system should be, because at zero temperature, it should be in the absolute ground state, but what you see is that very close to the ground state, but very far, very close in energy, but very far in configuration space, there are other uh, candidates that are nearly as good, but they are very different in terms of the configuration of spin. And so this is the kind of landscape that you need to think about to understand in the, in the context of physics what's going to happen dynamically. What's going to happen dynamically is that the system is never going to reach equilibrium, is going to get stuck in, in valleys that are not the optimal valleys, but that are you know, good enough. And the time it needs to reach the true ground state is going to grow uh, like the exponential of the size of the system for such a, a problem. So in physics, it's called you know, aging and out of equilibrium dynamics. But in terms of uh, what I warned you before, in terms of optimization, in terms of finding the optimal solution uh, using Monte Carlo, for example, it means that uh, the algorithm is going to never converge, uh, actually. But on the other hand, it might find solutions that are good enough, okay? It might find solutions that are not the true uh, best one, but are close in terms of energy or, or utility to the the best one, so they are good enough solutions, uh, satisfying solutions.
And the problem is that you don't really know which one you're going to find because depending on your algorithms, maybe you'll end up here, maybe you'll end up there, maybe you'll end up there. And so what is interesting from a philosophical point of view, uh, you know, thinking that agents are rational and try to optimize their utility function is that if you're confronted with such a complicated problem to solve, then you don't know what others are going to do because some of them are going to choose one solution, which is good enough, and some others are going to choose another solution. So you cannot use rationality as a way to infer what other people uh, are doing. So I think that in a, in a philosophical sense, it's a very important uh, model that shows that the, the uh, reality can be extremely complex. Something else related to this is that this is uh, the, the landscape for a given set of GIJs, but maybe, you know, maybe I don't measure the GIJ correctly. Maybe there's a little bit of noise in the GIJs, or maybe GIJs are evolving with time. So maybe today GIJ is equal to this, and tomorrow a GIJ will be changed by some small uh, perturbation, delta GIJ, or maybe, you know, I've not measured the GIJ correctly, so there's a little bit of error. And what happens is that because of this very small perturbation, you can have some of the uh, secondary minima that become the new minima. Okay, so when you change delta IJ a little bit, you can have uh, a change of what you call the ground state in a chaotic ma manner. So uh, when the system size goes to infinity, the Delta JIJ, you need to change the order of the different configuration is going to zero. So this, this is called chaos. And, uh, and I've alluded to that earlier in my lecture. So it's, it's a kind of, again, of a fragile optimization in the sense that if you change a little bit the value of the parameters, you can completely change the structure of the solution. So again, this is a very, I think this is a very important uh, paradigm to understand that optimization alone often is misleading because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's useless in a way to understand what people are going to do because depending on what they actually assume about the GIJs, they might end up, even if they are able to solve the problem, in the, the, they might end up in very, different configuration. And finally, not only you can have these small changes, but because of, of uh, small perturbations in the GIJs, some of the minima that existed before may completely disappear. So for example, because of a delta IJ that's very small, this minimum here can suddenly you know, be bypassed completely and disappear. And so you, know, you might be in a situation which is locally stable for some GIJs, and because you change the uh, GIJs a little bit, you're not locally stable anymore. So uh, this is again often called chaos, in a sense a little different from chaos in dynamical systems. It's chaos with respect to the uh, to the data you give to the optimization problem. Right, so that's, of course, uh, I mean, thin glass literature has exploded in the last uh, 50 years in, the, in physics, and there's, there's a lot of ramifications of this, uh, I think, very beautiful example that I've only touched upon very quickly in the last 15 minutes, but I, I think it's an important uh, item to add in these lectures for you to understand the well, where I think we're going in terms of uh, uh, transposing problems from physics into uh, economics and sociology. And so on that note, I'm ending these set of lectures. Of course, there's a lot I would have liked to talk about, and uh, for some reason I haven't had time, so I don't know if it's because uh, you're not in the room, so I'm, I was a little slower than usual, I don't know, but anyway, um, this is what I roughly what I want to speak about uh, to you this year. Uh, 
uh, I hope that uh, the exam will be uh, interesting and that we can uh, hold it in normal conditions. And I'm uh, and I'm reiterating my proposal to speak with any of you uh, next week, Wednesday. I'll send the link. Uh, I won't be in the room, but uh, I'll send the link. And if you have any anything you want to chat about, then feel free to connect. That's it, folks. Any question now? I don't know if is uh... hey Valentina is here. I mean Valentina is on the not physically in the room, but she's present. So in fifteen minutes you'll have Valentina, but until then, any comment, question? Oh she's here. <laughs> No? In the room, question? I'm surprised. I mean, that's one of the big changes is that there are really, really very few questions. So I don't know what you're taking out of all this anyway. Okay, well, I'll end the recording session and wish you good luck for the exam. This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so welcome back everybody to the last day. So the plan for today is to uh, discuss a little bit uh, the model which is given in the paper that I, I think was in the uh, ENS folder, I hope, or in any case, I just uh, sent it uh, to you uh, via email. So this is a paper of uh, 2015, and it is a little bit an excuse uh, for us to discuss about, uh, say, checking the stability of uh, solutions of Fokker-Planck equations. So let me first uh, tell you what is the idea of uh, the paper. Let me close the door first. And then I will tell you what uh, we are actually going to discuss. So the idea is to uh, write down a simple model of interacting firms. So we will just think at the model in terms of uh, firms indeed. But if you look at the paper towards the end, uh, there is a discussion on how to interpret the model uh, as, a, for example, then uh, epidemiological models or, uh, or as a model of interacting banks uh, in a financial market and so on. So there are plenty of possible interpretation. And uh, the interesting thing is that there are regimes in which uh, this, uh, the behavior of the system shows persistent oscillations, which uh, are called, we will call, uh, some synchronization phenomena. And uh, this is interesting because uh, somehow it's telling you that you have a model where you go from having a moment or period of uh, prosperity, if you think of this in terms of, uh, of an economy where everything seems to, uh, to go well, and then suddenly you have uh, the negative oscillation, you have a uh, abrupt crisis uh, in your economy, and this goes on in a cyclical way. Uh, and this is interesting because this crisis again happen without any external shocks uh, which perturb uh, your economy, but are really built in uh, in the choice of parameters of your model. So what we're going to do today is not really uh, going into detail of this uh, phase uh, where, we, where we have oscillations, but rather we are going to uh, estimate and compute what is the boundary of stability of the phase without uh, oscillation. So what we want to do uh, today, so these are some introductory comments if you want. Uh, and this starts, so if you have uh, the paper with you, if you look at uh, figure two, just to have an idea of uh, what the paper is about. So figure two gives you the behavior in time of a quantity that I will introduce in a minute that is essentially the fraction of firms uh, in your model that are, uh, that go bankrupt, so which have financial problems if you want. And you see from that figure that there are uh, two different regimes of parameters. So in one regime of parameter, you find that the behavior of this dynamical quantity uh, looks like this. So you have 
uh, some initial oscillation, a transient, but then you converge to some uh, stationary value for this fraction. And this happens for the parameter phi that I will introduce in a minute, uh, which is small, sufficiently small. Whereas you have another uh, phase, if you want, where this type of oscillations appear. So if you look at this plot, at that plot, so I don't change colors because I know that uh, it is very hard to uh, see them uh, on the screen. But uh, somehow in the second phase, you see that you have this uh, collective global uh, synchronized uh, oscillations uh, in the number of firms uh, that are bankrupt. And this happens whenever this parameter phi is large. And so the idea is that we are not going, as I said, to compute uh, explicitly uh, the solution to the time behavior of this uh, phi of t, but we want uh, somehow to estimate so, uh, right, estimate when the uh, let's say stationary solution, which is not oscillating, becomes unstable. And by when, I mean, uh, of course, for which values of parameter uh, this first uh, regime becomes dynamically unstable. So what does it mean uh, technically? Well, technically, it means that we are going to uh, try to solve for the stationary state of a Fokker-Planck equation, which uh, describes our model. And then, so this was comment one. And then we are going to uh, look at the stability of this uh, Fokker Planck equation. So let me add a comment on this. So, so what does it mean to look uh, at the stability? Well, let's uh, think about a very simple example that we discussed also last time. So let's think about uh, the case in which, for instance, we are looking at some. Uh, optima of uh, some function, like uh, the one that I'm drawing here. And you can have uh, different points which are stationary points, one which is, for instance, a local minimum and one which is a local maximum. And they are distinguished by their uh, properties of stability. So, of course, uh, the local minimum is stable and the local maximum is not stable. And one way to check this, that we are going to generalize uh, to functions today, is just to, uh, to do the following. So you fit into your point, which is the solution of your equation. In this case, the equation is with the potential. Uh, the equation would just be that we are asking that the derivative of the potential uh, is equal to zero. So you have different solutions. And to check the stability, what you can do is to do a little bit uh, of a perturbation around your, uh, your stable point and to check whether doing the perturbation and then letting the system evolve, the system goes back to your uh, original solution or, or it goes somewhere else. Of course, in this case, uh, with, uh, with a gradient descent like dynamics that we discussed last, last time, it will go back. So you perturb a little bit and then the system relaxes back uh, to the local minimum. So this is stable. Whereas if you see it in here, as you easily realize, as soon as you do perturbation, your system flows uh, somewhere else, and therefore this point will be stable. So the idea is to use uh, the same type of reasoning today, but for uh, full functions, which are uh, the solutions to, uh, to our Fokker-Planck equation, as I said. And now perhaps let's make a third comment, and then we start. And the third comment is about uh, current and stationary states. So, and and this introduces a little bit uh, the problem of today. So, the difference with respect to the Fokker-Planck equation that we are discussing today and the one that we discussed uh, in the last day is that today we are going to have a system with uh, what people call uh, some sources or some things. So today, we are having a Fokker-Planck equation. with sources and things. So this will become clear 
uh, want to write it down. But I just wanted to anticipate it because uh, I want to comment uh, on a difference with respect to what uh, we have seen last time. So last time, and in the previous today, we were always looking at cocker planck equations, which we could write in the, in the form of a continuity equation. So we had expression of the following form. So let's uh, think about one dimension. We had that the derivative of our probability was minus the derivative with respect to, uh, to the position, let's say, of a current. And the current was depending itself on the probability and on its derivative over time. So this, this is what is usually called a continuity equation. And then when we looked at the stationary point, uh, the stationary state, sorry, what we were doing is, well, uh, if the stationary state is stationary, it means uh, that the derivative over time uh, has to be equal to zero. And the derivative over time being equal to zero because of this uh, relation, was the same as asking that the current is equal to a constant. And we always assume that we could choose uh, this constant to be, uh, to be equal to zero. Uh, and there are arguments, so in some cases, there are arguments to, to, to make this choice. For instance, if you have uh, a Fokker-Planck equation which is defined uh, in the space which goes from minus infinity to infinity, and you have current, which are usually functions of the probability itself and of the derivative, then you can say, well, in order for the probability to be well normalized, it, the probability itself and the derivative have to go to zero uh, to infinity, but if they are constant and they are zero to infinity, then they have to be uh, equal to zero everywhere. Uh, which is true if you have an unbounded uh, interval. If you have a bounded interval like the one uh, that we discussed uh, in the exercise about the uh, Moran model uh, or the Kirman uh, and model last time, you can still uh, argue in a similar way. So you just uh, say, okay, I expect that there is no current in my stationary solution, and therefore I set this to zero. And setting this to zero gives me then an equation that I can solve uh, very easily with. Uh, with the separation of variables that we saw. Now, today this is going to be uh, a little bit different because, uh, precisely because we will have these sources and things. So, this means that our equation will be defined in some interval of x, and we will have special points such that whenever uh, our variable reaches uh, this point, it either dies in some way, so it disappears. Uh, from the model, and this will be the sink, or it is injected back uh, at that particular point uh, in our model, and this will be a search. So it is like having an open system in which you have some special points where you start uh, inserting, uh, let's say, new probability for your variable and points where you, uh, let's say, eject uh, the probability from your model. And therefore, you can easily uh, understand that if I start increasing probability here and taking it uh, back in here, there might be, even in the stationary state, some constant current in my system, which goes, uh, current of probability, which goes uh, in this direction. And therefore, we should not put this uh, j equal to zero, but we will uh, expect it to be constant. And this is what is going to happen uh, in, this, uh, in the example of today. Okay, so this was a little bit verbal, but maybe it becomes more clear when doing the, uh, the exercise. So let me see if I can some direction. Okay, if we just erase one of the black. So let's introduce the model and the equation, and then I think all of this talking will be a little bit more transparent. So 
so the model looks like this. You can look at the paper if you want a more detailed uh, description, but the idea is as follows. So you have N firms. Table them from one to n, and you have a variable which describes uh, each of these firms, which is the so-called fragility. Which you can think of as a measure of how bad uh, this firm uh, is doing. So this is uh, the ratio between the debt that the firm uh, has to pay. the bank or uh, to whoever gave some loan uh, to the firm I, divided by the total asset, so the total amount of money, if you want, of the ETH firm. So of course, the larger is the debt. So let's say if, uh, if you have a lot of debt, then this variable uh, X uh, will be negative. And the more negative is uh, this variable, the worse is, uh, is the state of your firm. Now, these firms uh, have a dynamic. So uh, the idea of the model is to uh, assume that the dynamics is like a random walk. So you have um, diffusion in this agility space uh, of the firms with some diffusion constant T. And then you have also some drift terms, so some constant velocity, uh, which is given by B, which are parameters. And then you have uh, two special points that, uh, based on what I said uh, before, can be interpreted as a source and as a sink. So the source, uh, the sink, uh, will be at a value of x, which uh, we call, let's say, minus theta. And the idea is as follows. So you have your x variable. You have 0 somewhere. And then you put a special at some particular point of your choice, this uh, minus theta. And you have all of these points which are performing some diffusion in this uh, x axis. And we say that whenever the point uh, has a depth which becomes as large as uh, negative, so, so, uh, these are now negative, it's smaller than, uh, than minus theta. So if you if you have a firm which crosses this particular threshold in here, then you say that the, the depth is too large and therefore the firm uh, goes uh, bankrupt. So this is a threshold for bankrupt. I hope the spelling is correct. So what this means is that healthy firms we live in this part of your configuration space. So these are the firms which are active. And then as soon as you cross uh, this threshold, your firm becomes, uh, say, inactive. So they file for bankruptcy, uh, and therefore they are, in some sense, no longer, uh, they freeze, they are no longer uh, into your model. So in terms, uh, of the Fokker-Planck equation, this will be uh, translated into the presence of an absorbing boundary. So whenever you reach uh, that point, then the corresponding probability has to go to zero. And we will see this. So we have this special value, which is, uh, if you want, the sink of our model. And then we also have a source. And the source is at x equal to 0. So what this means is that you have some firms which, uh, if you want, die or become inactive. But then you also decide that with a given rate, you can take one of these firms and uh, give some loan or give some money to it and revive it, so put it back uh, into the model. And you do this by uh, putting it back at this particular value of uh, fragility, which is, uh, which is zero. So this means that with some frequencies, I can take one of the firms which are dead and I can range like them into my, uh, let's say, axis or regime of active firms precisely at zero. And so this will be the source. 
where some firms will uh, appear with a certain frequency. And then you have uh, an extra ingredient, the final one, which is interactions. So these firms perform their random work with a given brief and with the diffusion. Sometimes they die, sometimes they are reinjected. But they also have some sort of interaction uh, that takes the form of some feedback, uh, which happens whenever one firm uh, dies or becomes inactive. So the idea is that uh, when the firm uh, becomes so bad that it reaches the values minus theta, then what happens is that the fact that this firm is failing influences negatively all of the other firms uh, because you have a debt that this firm had to pay and that now uh, it's unable to pay anymore because it is failed, that gets redistributed to all of the other firms uh, which are alive. So what this means, uh, maybe I should write it in words and then look at the formulas. Uh, so the, for, uh, the firms, that fail the debt, which is of the order of theta, is redistributed to all of the other uh, active firms. And the way we model this is by modifying the drift of those firms which are active uh, towards, uh, let's say, the negative axis whenever one of those uh, reaches uh, this threshold value minus p. So let's look at this with formula, which I hope is perhaps the best thing to do. So all of these ingredients uh, that I mentioned enter into some Fokker Planck equation that is written in the paper for this model. So this is the point one, point one, which is to justify the Fokker Planck equation that is given in the paper. So the Fokker Planck equation looks like this. So now this is, of course, the probability to have a firm which has a fragi fragility x at a given time t, which of course depends on time. So you have a drift term that depends on time itself that I call b of t, multiplied by the space derivative. So if, if you remember, uh, well, okay, let me comment on this later. Then you have the diffusion term, which we have seen many times. And then you have to, we have to model this source, so the fact that we are sometimes re-injecting uh, firms uh, at zero. And uh, we model it in the following way. So first, I forgot to tell you something. So from now on, uh, let me shift the x axis and then send it to x minus theta, so I shift it in such a way, I shift everything forward in such a way that now the threshold for bankruptcy becomes zero, and I have active firm in the positive semi-axis. And so the injection, which before was zero, now that I shifted, happens at a point x, which is equal to theta. So here you have, if you are at that particular point, delta function which selects uh, the point theta, you reinject your firm with a given rate that is this parameter phi. And the rate is multiplied by the fraction of firms which are inactive, so which are in the negative semi-axis at the given time t, which I call one minus phi of t. So what is phi of t? Phi of t is the fraction of a live firm. So this will be the integral in the positive semi-axis once I shifted everything of 
of x. So this is a fraction of active firm, which of course is not constant uh, in the model. So the total number of firms is constant. So if you if you want if you extend this integration to the full interval and take into account also those which are inactive, your probability is normalized to one. But if you focus only on the sub interval which corresponds to firms which are really participating to the economy, then you have a quantity which in principle uh, depends on time. So this explains uh, this term here, which is as a source. And then where is uh, the interaction uh, hidden, the interaction that I mentioned? Well, this is hidden in this drift uh, coefficient, E of T, e, which has a particular form. So B of T is equal to some constant drift, that is the B that I introduced before. And then you have an extra term which accounts for this redistribution of the debt. Uh, whenever somebody dies or becomes bankrupt, uh, which is of the following form. So beta here is uh, want another phenomenological constant of the model. It is the strength of the interaction, if you want, or of the feedback of one firm on all the others. Which is telling you that, of course, in an economy, whenever one firm uh, fails, this is not good for the others as well, maybe because they were depending on the product of that firm, uh, which they do not have available anymore, or because they, uh, they were exchanging with it, and so on and so forth. So there is a negative feedback uh, between uh, the different firms with a strength encoded in this theta. Then you have theta, so this accounts for how much debt is has to be redistributed uh, between all of the other firms. And then in here, to, uh, to control this feedback, you have T times the derivative space of your probability distribution evaluated at zero. So at the point where, uh, where the firms uh, are uh, disappearing from, uh, from the economy. And why does this uh, term have this form? So first of all, what is this? So the way you can interpret uh, this term in here is as a flux. So this is the flux of uh, say probability or the flux of firms, okay? That reach so uh, what do I mean by a flux? Well, a flux is telling you what is the probability for unit time and for uh, unit of surface. In this case, uh, if you focus on a small interval uh, around minus theta, that now became zero because we have everything. So this uh, flux controls, uh, if you want, what is the current of probability that crosses a little interval uh, of uh, size dx around the special point zero. So it is measuring, if you want, how much firms are, uh, are failing in a given unit of time. And uh, well, maybe if you, okay, let me, let me add the first comment. And then we explain this term a little bit better. So for, uh, the idea is, is, I hope it's clear. So it, it, what happens is that uh, if you have a lot of firms which are, uh, which are uh, failing, then you start getting a velocity that is uh, more and more uh, negative. So all of the other firms start altogether to drift themselves toward uh, the absorbing point because of this feedback term. And what happens at the absorbing point, so this is the last thing that we need uh, for uh, defining the model, 
Well, the absorbing point, as I just mentioned, is an absorbing point, so which means that the probability any time uh, at the point zero has to be set to zero. And with all of these terms, we have somehow defined the model that we are going to discuss today. So this is often called an absorbing boundary in the focal point language. So let me perhaps make a little bit of a comment uh, about this flux. Let me try to make this clear. Uh, okay, so how, why can we interpret this uh, as a flux, or what is the idea? Well, the idea is, is a little bit uh, as follows. So you have, again, your x-axis, you have this point uh, zero, and here you have some absorbing points. So whatever goes uh, beyond this point uh, becomes, uh, as I say, inactive, so it's no longer in your model. You have this special point uh, theta where you start injecting firms, so you somehow expect that you will have an excess uh, of probability around uh, this point because uh, that is where you put your firms with a given rate uh, i. So I'm now drawing what one can expect for the shape of this probability. And then you will have something that you impose, it has to go to zero uh, in here, and then it has to remain exactly equal to zero so this, uh, the, for, for whatever value of x which is negative, because these are no longer in your model, so you don't track them uh, with your dynamical Fokker Planck equation. And then at infinity, you should go down in such a way that you are normalizable. But the way you go to zero here is with a derivative which is, uh, which is non finite. And, and somehow this gives you what is uh, the probability flux to go to zero. So you will have a current of probability that flows uh, towards this point. And the way you can uh, make sense uh, of, of this expression here, I think it is as follows. So you look at the Fokker Planck equation, which describes your model, and then you try to integrate this in a small interval uh, dx, which is around your special point x. So let me take the left hand side. And let me integrate uh, this derivative in here with respect to x, which goes from minus epsilon to plus epsilon. So you don't have to write this down. It's just to try to motivate uh, this term in here. So if I do this, I take the derivative over time uh, outside. And what do I get? Well, I get the derivative over time of the probability uh, If, if I approximate this as if I assume that P is somehow constant in this little interval, or let me, let me write it like this. So this already tells you uh, what I want to say. So this is how much it changes the amount of probability that you have in a small interval around zero. And using the right-hand side, you do the same thing. So you integrate now this expression over X. In this case, you don't have to worry about this delta function because this delta function is far away uh, at this value of theta, which is not around an infinitesimal small interval uh, close to zero. So I can forget about the source term and I can integrate whatever remains, which has the form of a total derivative. And if I integrate, what do I get? I get the contribution, which is P of T, P of epsilon T minus E of minus epsilon T. And then I get the contribution from the diffusion, which is plus D, the derivative in X epsilon minus the derivative at minus epsilon. I hope you see this. Okay. And then I take epsilon 
uh, to zero. And if I take epsilon uh, to zero, well, actually, if you are to the left of this interval at minus epsilon, we are assuming that everything is equal to zero. So this will be zero, small, and the derivative will also be zero. And if I take plus epsilon, which goes towards zero as well, what I realize is that because of the absorbing boundary, this is also uh, converging to zero. So in the limit of epsilon small, which is what we're interested in because uh, we want to compute the flux, then this term will disappear. And what you are left with is precisely uh, this uh, derivative of the probability with respect to x, which is what we are uh, putting in here. So this was just to motivate why uh, the term which appears uh, in, in the drift has, uh, has this particular form. OK, so, so for the model, uh, we are more or less there. So you see the source is here. The sink, if you want, is encoded in this absorbing boundary. And the interaction is encoded in this time-dependent drift uh, for our firm. And now what we have to do is to try to solve uh, for the stationary state of this problem and then look uh, at the stability, which are points. Uh, so this was point one to motivate the model. And now let's do point uh, two and three. And I just realized that you didn't see the black word. Back here. Okay. So before we solve for the stationary state, let's try to organize a little bit all of the parameters that we have, which are many. So what are the parameters in the model? Well, we have essentially five parameters. So we have the, the drift B and the diffusion, as in a usual kind of work. Then we have the strength of the interactions or the feedback, which was discussed in beta. Then we have uh, the threshold for um, failure, which is uh, this parameter theta. And then what did I forget? Then we have this phi, which is the rate at which you range at uh, the firms uh, into the model. So these are many, but what you can show uh, by solving the model is that uh, essentially everything will depend on a combination of these, uh, of these parameters. So you can reduce uh, everything to the behavior of three uh, parameters. Uh, one is beta, which remains as it is. Then you can introduce a ratio, which is called the Peclé number, uh, that is uh, something which appears when you study transport of uh, heat to it, uh, that will not appear in what we are going to discuss, but let me introduce it uh, anyway, because it's mentioned in the paper. So this is uh, the ratio between uh, beta theta over the diffusion constant. And it is, if you want a measure of the drift versus the diffusion uh, of your uh, work where uh, the interaction does not enter. And then we have another parameter, which is instead important for us, that I call Z here, which is a ratio of time. And in particular, it is the ratio of the injection time at the rate at which one over the rate at which you reinsert firms in your model, so this is one over phi, divided by uh, the time, which is the time scale at which typically your uh, firms uh, are suppressed from the model, so that your firms uh, die, and uh, and this is computed in the limit when beta is particularly small. So when we can neglect uh, the feedback, then what is the typical time scale at which a firm uh, dies? Well, this is basically controlled uh, just by the uh, drift constant B. So I, at a given time, 
T0, I reinject a firm at theta, and then I ask what is the typical time which is required for each for it to, to reach zero and therefore disappear uh, from the model. And I can estimate this if I can neglect beta, if I can neglect uh, the diffusion, essentially as, uh, as B divided by, so uh, I want B is what? B is, is a velocity. So the, the, in order to go from here to here, I have to cover a distance uh, that is equal to theta with a velocity B. So what is the time that I need to do this? Well, it is related to B by, uh, by this relationship. So the tau that I'm interested in is just theta over B. Okay, and this is what I uh, put in here. So one over phi is a time, and then I divide by another time, which is theta over B, which is my parameter B time this uh, Z, sorry. And that is what will appear uh, in our calculation in a minute. So it's good to introduce it. And it's good to, to take or to have in mind a limit that will be useful later on, which is the limit when Z is going to zero. And again, you always have in mind, for instance, that beta is very, very small. So when uh, Z is going to uh, zero, then what we are saying, so, so this is the time at which we reinject versus uh, the time uh, for, for the firms uh, to die. And so the idea is that whenever we take this limit, we should, uh, we have essentially that uh, every time somebody dies, it gets immediately reinjected. So you don't have to wait uh, a lot in order to see it uh, reinjected. So in this limit, uh, any firm that dies, I say dies, but of course uh, it means it goes uh, bankrupt, it is immediately reinjected. And we will use this fact uh, in a minute to, uh, to fix some boundary condition uh, or to select some solutions of, uh, of the self consistent equation. So, just this is just a comment, uh, keep in mind this limit because it will be useful uh, in the following. Okay, so now that we have all of this, we can now try to solve for the stationary state of this. A particular equation, and I don't know what the best space uh, solution. So, I will keep the equation to this point three, and uh, this I will erase, but we will use it all the time. So, keep in mind all of these definitions. Okay, so now let's look for this stationary solution. So what does stationary mean in here? Well, in general, it means that you want things not to depend on time, but to be constant uh, time. And so the first thing that you can ask is that your fraction of active firm, which we define as phi of t, uh, in the stationary state is time independent and it is just equal to a constant uh, that I call phi zero. And with a very similar reasoning, you can also ask that all of the other time dependent quantities uh, that you have in your model reach a stationary state where uh, they do not depend on time. So for instance, you will ask that B of T will reach a constant value, which is B0. And what is B0? Well, if you remember 
what was the expression for B of T. So B0 was B plus theta theta. And then you add B times uh, the derivative, uh, which following the notation of the paper, I will call so the flux at zero, let me call it J of T. So this T times the derivative of T evaluated at X equal to zero. So this is a quantity which in general depends on time, which enters in my definition of B of T. But of course, if I ask that B does not depend on time anymore, then J should also converge uh, or be equal to a constant, which I call J zero. And of course, this should also. And of course, you have another quantity in here which depends on time, which is P itself. So the fourth thing that you have to ask is that your P of X and T is something which does not depend on time, which we call P stationary of X. Okay, now how can this be true that you reach a time independent value for this fraction of a live term whenever you have source and a sink in your system? So whenever your system is open uh, at this uh, particular point, zero and theta. Well, in order for the fraction of firms not to change, what you have to ask is that uh, somehow the, the, the flux of firms that you inject uh, at the point x equal to theta, so the incoming flux of probability in your model, has to be equal to the flux which goes out uh, from your system at the point zero, which was exactly given by this uh, j of t. So what this stationarity uh, implies, or what we have to impose in addition to this, is that the fluxes of incoming and outgoing are equal. So the rate at which firms die is the same rate at which firms are reintroduced into our model in such a way that the total number of firms or the fraction remains constant. So what this means is that J of T, which is the flux of outgoing firms, which we assume to be equal to a constant in the stationary state, has to be equal to the flux of incoming firms, which is given by this first term here. So it has to be equal to phi one minus phi zero. So in principle, you have phi of t, but in the stationary state, we assume that all of these are constant. So we have to impose this uh, particular relation in order for this assumption here to make sense. Okay, so now given this, let's try to uh, plug this into, uh, into the equation. So let's try to impose this and solve uh, the four for dp of x t over dt being equal to zero as we did uh, also last time with this assumption from here. And now, as I commented at the beginning, so dp dt equal to zero means that the right hand side of our equation is zero. And before we could translate this, or in simpler models, we could translate it, or if you want, in simpler model, we could write the right hand side in the form of a continuity equation. So as the total derivative of something, and then we add a current, and then we could set the current to zero. But now we have that delta function, which it's very tricky to write as a derivative of something. So you cannot uh, somehow embed this term into some continuity equation. So we have to do something else that looks a little bit different, but actually you will see it's uh, more or less the same thing. So this is looking for stationary state. So instead of putting the current uh, to zero, what we do is to integrate our Fokker-Planck equation with respect to x. 
that is essentially the same way in which you get a talent. So if you remember, in the usual continuity equation, you have something like this, dp over dt equals something. You set it to zero, and now getting the current means that you're integrating the right -hand side with respect to x. And if you do this, uh, this is the antiderivative, so you just get uh, j, which then you set to zero. So here we are not setting it to zero, but uh, we are not setting j uh, directly to zero, but we are, uh, let's say, setting the integral of the Fokker Planck equation. So these were many words, but it's pretty easy, actually. So this means, again, dp dt of xp equal to zero. And now what I do, this is also equal to the right side. And then I integrate both sides with respect to x. And because I have a delta function, I have to split two different cases. So if I integrate in an interval which does not contain theta, the delta function will not contribute. Whereas if I integrate in an interval which contains theta, it will actually contribute. So let's split the two cases. So let me fix a value of x which is smaller than theta. And then let me integrate the right hand side from x0 to this particular value of x. And we will choose x0 later on. So if I do it, the left hand side is just the integral of 0, which is 0. And then what do I have? I have p of t times the integral of the derivative. I hope you can see, of course not, um, the Fokker Planck equation. Mm -hmm. right, what is x0? Yes, x0 is uh, for the moment is arbitrary, but uh, I will later on. So you can, well, if we can choose it directly to, no, let me leave it. We will choose it to be 0. So for the moment, I just take my Fokker Planck equation and I integrate over an interval which goes from some point x0 larger than x0 to some arbitrary point x smaller than theta. Okay. I can choose x0 and it will be convenient to choose it equal to 0 because there uh, we know that p has to be equal to 0. So this is what I'm doing uh, in a minute. So sorry, I don't think you, you see the equation, but I hope you have it in the notes. I'm just integrating the right hand side and I get the following. So this term was multiplied by a space derivative. So if I integrate, I just have p of x p minus p of x zero t. And then I have the diffusion term, which I have two derivatives. I integrate one, and I get the other one. So so far, this looks like the normal cocker planck equation because x is smaller than theta, and so the delta is not giving any contribution. And then I choose, as, as you pointed out, x0 equal to 0. So if I choose x0 is arbitrary, so if I choose x0 equal to 0, this term here is vanishing because I have my absorbing boundary condition at x0. And what is this term in here? Well, I have to remember that this is equal to this uh, quantity j uh, that I defined before. So j of t was t times the derivative of p of x t the x evaluated at t, which is precisely this term here. And now, of course, I'm using uh, the wrong notation because if I put a zero on the left hand side, it means that I'm already considering the stationary state. So this is actually pre stationary x. There should be no time dependence. This is pre stationary at x zero. This is the derivative with respect to x of pre stationary. Sorry about this. And this would be the derivative of pre stationary computed at x. And therefore, this product in here will just give me 
under my stationarity assumption, the constant which is zero. Okay, so altogether, and this is under my stationarity assumption, this would just be zero. So the equation reads d0 p stationary of x, this term vanishing, plus b derivative of p stationary of x of dx, minus j0 equal to 0. And now I can use the usual trick uh, that I use whenever I want to find a stationary state. And indeed, as long as theta is more, if x is more than theta, this is just the usual Fokker Planck equation. So, what I can do to solve this equation is the uh, usual separation of variables that we have discussed uh, last time. So, let me write it in a faster way. Actually, let me write it as so this is just a little bit of algebra that I'm doing. So this is J zero minus zero stationary of X divided by D. Okay. And then to do the separation of variables, I have, uh, remember, I have to bring everything which depends on P on one side and everything which depends on X on the other side. So this in differential form can be rewritten as DP stationary divided by G0 over D minus G0 over D stationary equal to Okay. Then I integrate. We did last time again from some arbitrary x zero to x smaller than theta, and then it fixed directly x zero to b zero. Okay. And as usual, what you get. On the left hand side is a logarithm, and what you get on the right hand side is just x. Now we have to track the minus sign. But on the left hand side, you would have minus the logarithm. If I do the integral, I would have got minus the logarithm of j0 over d minus put them to the other side. So this I will have to evaluate from x to 0. And then I have another constant, which is front, which is minus d over d, right? So if I take the, so this is the antiderivative. Now, if I take the derivative of the log, I get one over this, and then I have a constant, which is minus d0 over d, which I have to count in this factor. And I have to evaluate it from x to zero, or if you want to p of x. P of zero, this should be P of X to P of zero. So if I do this, I will just get the log of this evaluated at X, the minus the log of this evaluated at zero, which I can write as the log of a ratio. And the P stationary at zero, we know that it has to be equal to zero. So I think one should get something like this for the left hand side, free to check. And the right hand side is easy, it is just a factor of x. Okay. So now let me bring this constant 
on the other side, so that I have minus d0 over d times x, and I get rid of it. And now I can exponentiate. So if I take the exponential of this expression, what do I get? I have g0 over d minus d0 over d, d stationary x is equal to this constant that now I bring on the other side, g0 over d, e to the minus g0 over d times x. Which means that my p station i of x is what? Well, d, you see that I can eliminate it from here. Divide everything by e in it, and my uh, p stationary will be j zero over d zero, one minus e to the minus d zero over d. Of course, under the assumption that x is smaller than p. So we have the first part uh, of our solution. And now what do we have to do? Well, now we have to look at what is the behavior when x is larger than theta. And when x is larger than theta, then we have an extra contribution to our integrated focal planck equation, which comes from the delta. So now I assume that x is larger than theta. I play the same game uh, that I did before. So I take 0 equal to the integral from x0 equal to 0 up to this uh, x of the right hand side. And what I get is the following. So let me write. Right. Shorter, well, I get 0 equal to so one contribution from as before from b0, so b0 stationary. Of x. Then I have the contribution from the diffusion, and this was d, the derivative at x, minus d times the derivative at 0, which we say was equal to j0. And then we have the final contribution from the delta function, which is just phi 1 minus d0, or phi. And this, remember, this was our source. OK. And now we should remember something. So do you recognize any cancellation? I erase all of the formula, but remember that when we impose a stationarity and we equated the flux, the equation was precisely the following. So the flux of firms which were dying has to be equal to the flux of those which were injected, which was phi 1 minus the difference phi 0. So this was because of stationarity. So we can use this. In here, and we see that these two terms cancel. And so the equation is now particularly simple. It's just uh, it's telling me that my stationary distribution for x larger than theta has an exponential form. So it will be a constant times e to the uh, this minus d0 over d times x for x larger than theta. Right. OK. So now there is a final little step to do. So this was one piece of the solution. The other one is up here. This was a small enough fact. This is for large enough x. 
and you see that I have some undetermined uh, constant a in here. So what is a, a clever way to match? Uh, well, I just told you. So what is a clever way to uh, determine the value of the constant? Well, uh, what you can do is you you ask that this uh, distribution is continuous at the point p. So its derivative will not be continuous because you have the data function, but the distribution itself uh, is continuous. So you have to equate the expression that you have for smaller values uh, of x to the expression that you have for larger values of x when computed exactly at theta. So this is the last step. Which is to fix, or almost the last step. Which is to fix my constant A using continuity of B. Okay, so for x smaller than theta, we had the expression that you perhaps don't see anymore. But let me write it. So if x is smaller or equal is smaller than theta, we have an expression, and then I compute this expression exactly as at theta, and it gives gives me j zero over b zero, one minus e to the minus b zero over d times theta. And then I equate it to the expression that I get for x larger than theta, that is just the exponential. So this is uh, a e to the minus d zero over d times theta. And this allows me to fix uh, the value of a. So a will just be equal to j zero over d zero e to the d zero over d theta minus 1 by multiplying each side of the equation by e to the bc over d uh, times theta. Okay, and once I have this, I have uh, the full solution for almost the full solution for my uh, for my stationary state. So should I rewrite it? Write it. It is J zero over B zero, one minus E to the minus B zero over B times X, where X over equal to theta, and it was A E to the minus B zero over B times X, where X larger equal to theta, and it is continuous with theta, and A is given here. Okay, so this is almost the solution. Why do I say almost? Because now we have to remember that we did some assumptions when we reach this point. And we have to check that these assumptions are actually self-consistent with the solution that we found. And this is a step which substitutes a little bit step C in the usual solution for the stationary state, which is the normalization. So in here we don't we don't want to check the normalization in the full interval, but remember that we had this parameter phi phi zero, which was which we assumed to be fixed, and this was the fraction of terms which are active. That was defined as the integral from zero to infinity in the x of my, in this case, stationary solution, the stationary of x. And now what I have to do is I plug my solution for uh, the stationary, I compute uh, this integral, I'm not going to do this, this is just integral to the exponential. You just have to split into the different uh, regime from 
from zero to theta and from theta to infinity. And you get out a simple constant that is j0 theta divided by b0. So this is the last point C. And this is nothing but a self consistent. for by zero. Why is it self consistent? Well, because you have in here this constant V zero, but then you have to remember what was V zero. So V zero uh, here, and you have to remember what is J zero. So remember that. J zero was the flux of, or was equal in the stationary state to the flux of uh, incoming term. So this we impose to be equal to one minus phi zero. So inside this J zero, there is uh, a phi zero uh, which appears. And also inside of B zero, so if you remember, this was B plus beta theta. J zero itself, and therefore this is B plus theta theta phi one minus phi zero. So if you plug these two expressions inside this equation, you get an equation for your phi zero, which you need to solve in order to complete uh, the solution to your model. Phi zero is not a parameter, it's part of the solution to the model. So let me rewrite the equation and then you will see that it is simple. So phi zero is theta times j zero, so it is uh, theta times phi one minus phi zero. And I will divide both numerator and denominator by theta times phi. So what I'm left with is one minus phi zero in the numerator. And then I have in the denominator b divided by theta phi plus uh, beta. And then I have theta phi 1 minus phi 0, but I divide it by theta phi. So here I'm left with 1 minus phi 0. And the reason why I wrote it in this form is just that you recognize in here something that we defined uh, at the beginning. So this was the ratio between time scales uh, that we called uh, Z. So we can rewrite this as a quadratic equation for phi zero. So this is phi zero Z plus beta one minus phi zero is equal to one minus phi zero. And then we can solve this. Uh, where? Up there. So we just solve this second order equation and we have a now to decide how to choose the sign from the square root. In general, we get two solutions, plus or minus, which will be of the following form. I have one over two beta. Z plus beta plus one plus minus square root of Z plus beta plus one. Square minus four beta. Okay. And here comes, oops, sorry. Here comes the comment that we made at the beginning. So when we introduced uh, this Z, so now we have to choose what is the meaningful solution between plus and minus, and we can use. Uh, this intuition that we had uh, when introducing Z. So this idea that when Z goes to zero, 
and always beta is hugely small, then you should expect that whenever somebody dies, it gets immediately reinjected. So with a time scale which is much, much faster than the one of that. And therefore, if you are in this situation, what do we expect uh, in this limit for the value of phi? Well, if whoever dies gets immediately rejected, then we expect that all of the firms in our model will be in the interval of active firm. Because as soon as they go out, I put them back uh, immediately or very fast uh, into the model at x equal to theta. And therefore, we should expect that in this limit, phi zero goes to one. So this is just to say that using this, we can select uh, what is the good solution. So we just have to look at the limit that's going to zero for this equation and see if we get one with, uh, with either with plus or with minus. And what you find is that the good solution, if you do this, is actually the one with the minus. So the good phi zero to choose uh, has a minus sign uh, in front. Well, why? Because when z is equal to zero, here you just have to, there is just a little thing that we pointed out. So when z is equal to zero, you can, you have b plus one square minus four b, you can rewrite it as b beta minus one square. And then you, you have to remember that the parameter zeta that we introduced was the ratio of time scales when we can neglect uh, beta, so we, we always have this assumption that beta is small. And if beta is small, then this value is negative. So when you take the square root of the square, you have an absolute value, which flips one sign. And this is why, if you do the math, you find that minus is a good solution. Just, just keep in mind that this, uh, what you have inside the square is typically negative in the regions that we are considering, where you should expect phi zero going to one. Okay, so with this, uh, we, uh, we conclude the first part. Oh, it's super late. Well, this, <laughs> okay. So let me give you an idea. So what this shows is that uh, you can find a solution for your uh, stationary state. And actually, you can argue that you always have a solution to this self-consistent equation, uh, which always lives in a good regime. So in some sense, uh, so you may wonder, when, does, when do I have to throw away this solution? Well, one thing that you could expect, which should be a trivial thing, is that at a certain point you find values of phi zero such that uh, you get that one of these parameters explodes and this would signal that uh, what you're doing is not good any longer and you have to uh, look for another solution. Now, this is not what happens in this model. So in this model, you always find that phi zero is uh, a solution that is admissible. But what you have to check is, uh, and therefore the stationary that we found uh, is an admissible solution. But what you have to check is really, as I said before, the stability. So what changes is its stability. So let me go very fast towards or through the second exercise where you uh, and give you the idea of how you check actually the stability and determine when it breaks down. This is true. And the idea is to use precisely this picture of perturbing a little bit and seeing if you get back uh, to your original solution. Except that now, what do we have to perturb? Well, we have to perturb a full function, which is our solution for, uh, for the Fokker-Planck equation. So how do we perturb a function? Well, we introduce, or we write our P of X T as our stationary solution, plus some small perturbation in functional space, which I call P1. That now being a perturbation, we can assume it is no longer stationary, but it will depend uh, on time. And this is small because I'm putting uh, a factor of epsilon 
in front. So we make this uh, answer for our equation. Then, of course, if we perturb our distribution, we are also perturbing all of the parameters which implicitly depend on the distribution. So we have to assume that beta goes to some, sorry, b goes to b0 plus f times b1, j goes to j0 plus times j1, and what else? Phi goes to phi0 plus f times phi1. So we make this answer, and then we plug all of this into our Fokker-Planck equation. And we will get a term which does not depend on epsilon, which cancels because it is precisely. So we, if we select B0, J0, Phi0, and P stationary as before, the Fokker-Planck equation is satisfied and it is stationary, so that term will cancel. And then we will get a correction which is uh, of the order of epsilon. So I will just, I will go on for like five minutes, don't worry, I will just write what is the equation that you get and how do you study it. So if you plug into the Fokker-Planck equation, you do the math, you isolate the term which is of order epsilon, you get an equation for this uh, correction P1 of X and T that I write in this form. So you have P over DT. So now I collect all the terms which depend on P1 on the left hand side. You have a diffusion term, and then you also have a drift term. All of this applied P1 of X and T. And on the right hand side, you will get terms which depend on the correction on our time dependent quantities. And if you do this properly, you should find this V1 of T times our stationary distribution. So this is over the zero and epsilon, and this was over the epsilon, so that's why you get a distribution. And then you also get a contribution from the source, which depends on this correction phi. Okay. And now you can, so now you have to solve uh, this equation to get P1 as a function of uh, your time dependent quantities. And this is not something that we are going to do, so you can look at the paper, but what is the idea? So the idea is that what you have in here is an operator that I call G to the minus one. And so you have, what you have to do to get P1 is just to invert uh, this operator. And this operator, so you see, uh, it's an operator which depends uh, on derivative. Uh, but you know how to write uh, the inverse. So G is reminiscent of a green function for those uh, who have this terminology in mind. But anyway, you can show that this equation can be inverted. Well, formally, I call this function f of x and t, my p1 will just be my operator g applied to the function f, and this will itself give a function which will depend on x and t. And you can show, so this is similar to what you do when you want to solve a heat equation, which is just uh, basically the equation that we are looking at. Uh, we can show that the inverse, so g, which is the inverse of this operator, we know how to solve for, for this. So we know uh, that so this is an integral operation with a kernel, which is so-called heat kernel, uh, that we can compute. So there will be uh, a kernel that is given in the paper explicitly. And I can write this right side as the kernel evaluated at x minus y, t minus tau, times my function at y tau integrated in dy tau. And this kernel is, is essentially a Gaussian. It's the usual kernel that you get 
uh, when you look at the problems of diffusion. So if you want details, uh, you can look at the paper. But somehow the crucial point is that we can solve for P1, and we have P1 as a function of this, uh, this P1 and P1 and Phi1. But now B1 and Phi1 are also somehow unknown. They are the perturbation uh, that we use in our functional space. So once we have P1, we then have to impose some self-consistency. Okay. So you have to impose self-consistency. So yeah, P1 as a function of phi1, but then remember what was phi1. Well, phi1 is to order epsilon is the integral of uh, P1 itself. So the first self-consistent equation that you have is that phi1 has to be equal to the integral x of your P1 of x and t. And then you have a self-consistent equation for B1 which is related to the derivative of, uh, of one. So B1 should be equal to the following thing. Okay, so these are the two self-consistent equations that we have to pose once you have uh, this solution for B1. And now last comment. How do you check and try to find a solution to this uh, equation? Well, one thing that you can do is to make an ANSAT for the form of this phi1 and, and b1, and this is what they do in the paper. And you make an ANSAT which hints to the presence of population, but this you understand from the full solution of the model. But anyway, you make the following answer. You assume that you can write phi one as some constant phi times some exponential, where, where alpha is general complex, and b one you can write it as some other constant times the same exponential. You plug this into the self-consistent equation. You do uh, all of the algebra. And what you get out of this are the equation then, the paper. So now we have three parameters to fix, phi, b, and alpha. And you see that the equation then in the paper that maybe you also looked at the homework have the following form. So you can rewrite the two self consistent equation in, in the form of a matrix which depends explicitly on alpha acting on the vector the constant being equal to zero. Now you ask, how can I find a solution to this equation, which is non-trivial? Of course, a trivial solution is that phi and beta are zero. But to have non-trivial solution, you need that this matrix is not the interpreter, which is not objective, so that you have non-zero vectors which belong to the kernel of the matrix M, so such that if I apply M to them, uh, I get zero. And so what you have to ask is that the determinant of this matrix alpha is equal to zero because this then tells you that the kernel of this matrix, uh, so the set of vectors where the action is zero, is, is not just given by the zero vector. And in this way, you get an equation for alpha that you try to solve. You have different regimes, so here you have to play, solve this numerically, uh, play a little bit. Uh, remember that alpha. Uh, the answers that we are making uh, complex, so you will get an equation for the real part and an equation for the imaginary part. And you will find, and this is the final point, 
you will find three types of solution, so three regimes. Depending on the parameter, you can find three types of solutions for your alpha. So in the first case, you find that your real part of alpha is smaller than zero and the imaginary part of alpha is zero. And this is precisely the regime where you can claim that your solution is stable. Because if we go back in here, so remember phi one was the perturbation of phi, so we are assuming that phi is equal to phi zero plus some perturbation that we are imposing. We are assuming that it has this form, but then you see that this exponential will be e to the real part of alpha times t, and then you have cosine of the imaginary part of alpha times t plus i the sine, same thing. So if the imaginary part is zero of alpha, this cancels, this is equal to one. And if the real part is negative, you, you see that you have an exponential which decays very fast uh, to zero. And therefore, in your perturbed dynamic, you go back to a value of phi of t, which is precisely the phi zero that you have determined before. And so this corresponds to stability of your equation. And then you find another regime where your imaginary part is different from zero, but the real part of alpha is still uh, smaller than zero. So this is still stable. But you see that if you have a non-zero imaginary part, this somehow suggests uh, that you should have some oscillations so that you converge back. Let me do a little drawing. You perturb your phi, you will have some oscillations, and then eventually you converge to the stationary value phi zero. And finally, as you expect, you have a regime of parameter where actually you find that the real part of uh, alpha is larger than zero and the imaginary part is do whatever. And this is really, so the first value of parameters at which this happens is really what is telling you that you are developing an instability. And therefore, that you should throw away the solution that we have computed in the first exercise, because as soon as you perturb a little bit from that, you flow uh, somewhere else. And to determine how you flow in this regime, you then have to solve uh, for the full uh, time dependent uh, Fokker Planck problem. And this, uh, in general, you don't know how to do. So there are, in the paper, you use numerics uh, for simulation uh, of the dynamics. But let's say, in general, this going into this unstable phase and finding the solution is a very uh, hard problem that, uh, that is not discussed analytically in the paper. OK, so that's uh, it. Sorry, it is very late. And so for, uh, for the last exercise on the kolmogorov shmirnov test, so you have it uh, in the solutions of the today. And of course, if you want, we can discuss it on Wednesday or in the the question and answer file. And if you want to write questions before Wednesday in there, uh, feel free to do it, and we will address them uh, either there or uh, in this section. Question? No question on? Yes. Yes. So there, uh, just to make it clear, there is a. I will write an email because I think it was not clear. So there was a question on the exam. The exam will be uh, written, I think. Let's see what Macron is going to say today or tomorrow, but I think it will be written. And it's going to be a paper to read and to discuss. So there are some technical questions and then many other questions about the interpretation uh, of the paper. So it is, uh, there is not the choice between let's say a standard exam and a paper exam, but it is uh, only the paper and you can look at the exams from last years, which are in the folder uh, to have an idea, okay? Okay, so if there are no questions, have a nice study week.